work in the dirt, you can keep your weights clean. Oh, work in the dirt, you can keep your weights clean. Oh, work in the dirt, we don't cope, we destroy, motherfucker, move back. I've got to pass it to someone else. Um, yeah, thirty-five point seven percent or nothing. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So obviously Dan's part of Ant's crew, um, uh, but he's the southern representative of of the northern crew. Every, yeah, everyone thinks they're like, yeah, I'll come and train at Durham, and I was like. Well, that'd be annoying. That's a seven-hour drive for me. So <laughs> they, they think they think that I live there. Um, it's not the accent. It's definitely not the accent. Well, it uh, did take me a long time. From, then? Where's everyone from? I'm uh, from Bristol. Bristol. Far. Um, I'm South Birmingham. Oh, and I'm uh, I'm I'm the talking Welsh guy. Oh, they call him. Uh, I, used to, I used to mess with Flex Lewis and talk about the the old. Um, in the valley, sheep shaggers. Well, yeah. I knew, I knew that was coming, but it's like we, we, we fuck them, you eat them. <laughs> Does that make me gay? No, it just okay. it adds a bit of extra taste. It's all right, it's good yeah. for you. If, if you're fucking them, then they must be full of fucking high testosterone. That's fine with me. <laughs> as long good as I'm not eating them. Wales, though. What's that, bud? Good bodybuilders in Wales. Yeah, we, for a for a, such a small country, we've produced some good guys. You know, obviously relevant to the size of the the country, but I guess ultimately. But I think in Wales, it's it's you get introduced to like rugby or it's or it's drugs. It's one of the other, and bodybuilding's a nice mix of both, isn't it? So <laughs> <laughs> I always find the Welsh are hardcore, man. They get into an incredible condition. Is that because there's fuck all to do around there? So you just fucking go to gym <laughs> every day. Must be the mo- mountains with all the mountains gives an extra cardio in, you know. Well, I yeah. think that probably is true. Though it's like, I mean, there's more going on now, but there probably wasn't a lot going on. You find like the working, you know, the working towns, the real working towns, were the spawn of the real bodybuilders, you know, like the industrial towns and stuff. Like a, a lot of towns up north, like it's not really down south was wasn't really much of a scene to be honest. Yeah. No, and it's, it's. I think it's relevant. Like the sport, like in Wales, the main sport has always been rugby, so it's much more physical, much more like it lends itself. All the guys I know who come from rugby have got big legs, and uh, that kind of lends itself to the bodybuilding scene a little bit. Um, like the football players and stuff, they don't tend to transition quite so well. Apart from Marcus Rule, do you remember? He was like, "Oh yeah, I played soccer, and then I got a knee injury, so I did some leg extensions and weighed three hundred pounds." Well, Troy, didn't didn't you play football? Yeah, I did originally. Yes, yeah, so I got into bodybuilding originally, just being very lightweight. I was about 155 pounds, weight left winger. Yeah, so there you go. That, that kind of trumps my entire argument a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I was a winger, and then um, I played for Nottingham Forest and signed pro for them at 17, and then got let go. And then I was like, "What am I going to do now?" And then I just obviously found the gym, and that was it. That was it, just casually turned pro and... Oh, man, it was, it was <laughs> eight years. That took eight years to do. Yeah. You still did it a lot quicker than us three. Still fucking not that. <laughs> <laughs> so what, where about are you, Troy? Where, um, wasn't you training in Muscle Works, was it, at one point? Yeah, I was there for 12 years, Muscle Works, Bethnal Green. Bethnal Green, um, yeah. Yeah, great memories there. A lot, a lot of great training sessions. I, I actually remember a guy named Warren Treasure. Do you know him? Warren Treasure, Mr. Universe, did the yeah. universe a few times. He would come down from Birmingham and he would train with Dorian and then come down and train with me. And there were some intense workouts we used to do. But yeah, Bethnal Green Muscle Works was, was, was a good time. I went, I went there once. It was awesome. Hardcore gym, in it? I don't think they even had a women's changing room. There's like, no, if you're a woman, fuck off, unless you're going to train like a man. Well, it's, come, yeah. it's come, come full circle now. They haven't got women's changing rooms again. It's just because there's no such thing as a woman, apparently. <laughs> uh, it's going to be mixed, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> right, before we get too deep, let me do the intro on this, just because obviously we haven't done an intro for a while. 
So uh, welcome back to Bash Bros Podcast. We are on episode 91. Um, we're lucky enough that Troy has opted to help us out. We've uh, we've been looking for a guest, somebody worth picking their brain. He popped up on Instagram and nobody better than this man who was who was in all the magazines when I first started bodybuilding. So looking forward to picking your brain, bud. And uh, firstly, thank you for taking the time. I know obviously you're living half around the world now, so it's not as easy as just jumping on, but do appreciate you taking the time. Um, but what we traditionally do, and I know obviously, like I said to you previously, a lot of our viewers are going to not know who you are. And that's mm-hmm. an insult really because of who you are to us. But to a lot of them, they're not old school. So just for their benefit, give us a little rundown or whistle, whistle stop tour of, of your bodybuilding career, what got you into it, um, and then sort of how it kind of panned out for you up until where you are now, really. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the intro, Johnny. Uh, yeah, my background just started from playing football, really. Uh, I was obsessed with playing football, wanted to become a pro. Um, ended up signing professional forms for Northampton Town, then got let go a year later and then was thinking, what am I going to do next um, due to being let go? And then I needed to put on muscle anyway. So I played a bit of semi-pro football and then started weight training and fell in love with it ever since. That was in 1994. Fucking hell, a long time ago. And can I swear, by the way? Is that okay? Oh, just, yeah, just, don't just worry me. about that. Dan, I'll be doing that. that Dan's all sorts of twisted, so be prepared. Okay. All right, I'll set the tone. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah, it was um, b- b- bodybuilding just came out of nowhere. Um, and what really got me, this is really weird, I've mentioned this story before, was a, a guy, a Hollywood actor named Marky Mark, Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, yeah. He had a video called the Marky Mark, video, uh, Marky Mark Workout. And it was on VHS, and I'd watched that every day and I started doing the old concentration curls and then uh, push-ups in the bedroom and then it led to weight training and then didn't look back really then I started training in in southeast London and then I said to myself one day where do all the best bodybuilders train in London and it was in Bethnal Green which was about an hour train train ride on the tube so I'd go there five days a week religiously and then um, while I was doing that, that was in 2000. And in 2001, I did my first show, uh, Stars of Tomorrow, if I remember rightly, in Canary, Canary Wolf. Um, I got second, a guy named Russ Parker, um, he won. And then I qualified for National Britain in Nottingham and then placed second at the first timers. And that was it, really. I was like, OK, I can maybe do something here. And then I was a middleweight for a while. And in 2000, and I think it was 2003, I placed last place as a middleweight at, at, at Britain. And then really wasn't sure if I was going to carry on or, or, you know, quit. And then after that, I decided just to focus on doing a Yatesy, get, get hibernate and focus on training and nutrition. And then uh, a year later, came back, went in, went in as a fully blown heavyweight. Uh, came in at 228 and then uh, won, won the Lemon and Spa, beat Paul Delahaye, which I was mentioning in the intro, and then um, they made my heavyweight debut, placed fourth. Um, Paul Delahaye got his pro card, Zach Khan got second, Linville Miller got third, I got fourth. And then um, that really kind of gave me the confidence to say, okay, I, there's a shot, maybe potentially in the next two years of getting a card. And then um, yeah, I, I basically trained with Harold a lot more up in Crawley. And um, we just decided that we were going to do things a little bit differently. And then one year later um, in Nottingham, I, I was in my best condition, I felt. And then um, Flex Lewis was obviously up and coming. He won his weight class in the light heavies, if I remember rightly. And he just signed away the contract, I believe. <clears throat> And then I ended up, yeah, I won the heavies. Beat Zach came in massive, and I felt that they were going to give it to Zach. Uh, but I was obviously in a little bit; it was in really good condition, if I remember rightly. I won the heavies. Uh, Zach got second, um, and then Pat Warner got third. He was in shape too. And then I got my pro, and then obviously went through to the overall. Met Flex Lewis in the overall, and then they gave me the they gave me the win. 
which I was obviously uh, ecstatic about. And then that's where things went a little bit pear-shaped after that. I ended up doing two pro shows at the time, did the Montreal Pro, like placed 10th. And then I did the Spanish Grand Prix three weeks later and then made top six there and missed out one place um, for getting the Arnold Classic invite. And then after that, what I should have done is gone back to England and gone back to the drawing board. But at the time I was talking with Flex Lewis and he was going to move to Reno, Las Vegas. And he said, why don't you move to North America? Anyway, I actually met a Canadian girl at the time. So I just decided um, I just signed a contract with Muscle Tech, and then I came over and that's when everything kind of the bodybuilding really sort of took a dive, so to speak. And I ended up taking a long sabbatical away from bodybuilding. Actually, I did two, two, two more pro shows. I did the Ironman Pro. Phil Heath won that in L.A. I didn't place. And then I did the Europa in Dallas. Um, and it basically couldn't take am I, we don't talk about drugs here we don't have to talk yeah, about yeah yeah of course okay that was the first show i ever did didn't touch any growth hormone didn't do any insulin um came in really really flat and didn't place there and that's when i kind of just got really pissed off and i think my attitude at the time wasn't really in the in the best situation and then ended up taking a long break away from bodybuilding and then 2015 came around and then i just thought you know what i'm gonna come back and then everything was going great and 2015 got up to about 260 and then tore my pec, uh, my right pec, and that was it. So here we are today, still kind of left the front door up, well, the left, left the back door open and um, still kind of involved with, with the bodybuilding scene, if you will, especially the Canadian bodybuilders. There's some really good guys out here. And um, I'm personal training at a gym called Pure Muscle and Fitness. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it. It's, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, it's got a reputation. Yeah, so I'm training clients there now. So it's it's good to see a lot of the pros there. Um, it's different mentality to the Brit British guys. The way the way we do it, um, they they believe in volume and frequency. Where I think the English guys favour intensity and work ethic. Um, so it's a different spectrum of, of training philosophies when it comes to the Americans and, and the Brits. But kind of that's like the, sh the short, the cliff notes of, of my, my career, really, as, as a pro and where I am right now. Can I ask a question? Um, your pec, how did you do it? I was doing incline, uh, not incline, I was doing flat bench press, uh, close grip, obviously. <laughs> I was doing close grip bench press just with 225. I don't feel like a loner anymore. I'm, I've done mine three times. Oh, 225 really? pounds. Just 225. Wow. That's all it that's all it took. And I heard it go. And I just knew instantly. And then I went into the changing room. I took took my took my um my, my shirt off. And then you saw the internal bleeding yeah. uh, coming out down down the uh down the it starts at the top there and then travels down. Yeah. My entire upper body was purple. Yeah. Yeah, it's a horrible injury. It's one of those ones. But um, obviously, I guess it's a different scale, the extreme for you being a professional, um, the recovery from that and, and being marked so heavily down against such, you know, real, you know, the, the, the pro leagues, there's so many fine points, like different between everyone A, a peck day is going to make a massive difference for me as an amateur. Obviously it's, it's not as, as severe, it hasn't necessarily ended my career, but it certainly <coughs> impact, impacted my, um, impacted my placings heavily. Yeah. Well, you can, um, in the amateurs, you can, the spectrum's large enough, you can kind of make up for it in other areas. In the pro, like, you know, these people are the perfection, aren't they? They're the, you know, the only person who kind of managed to pull it off for a bit and obviously it affected his placings was Tony Freeman. He did a, a lot of shows with that and it was it was heavily damaged. Um, but for some reason, they just liked him, I think. Yeah, yeah. and Kevin, Kevin Lavroni after he did That's it. Right. Yeah, but his wasn't that severe, was it? Let's no. be honest. And actually, yeah, it looked uh, like he kind of done both. So it was like, yeah, he had he had with those insertions that looked, yeah, that looked like that anyway. But yeah, did you have surgery on yours, Troy? No, no. Now, originally, guys, I, I had a bit of a, a right dodgy shoulder to begin with, 
And I think I was, I did it back in Alberta when I was training out there. I was trying to shoulder press to 150s, stupid. And it, it's never, it was never, never really felt the same ever since. And I think it's just a niggling injury that forced me to go into ex internal rotation, which meant always in this fully shortened position. So it was just, it wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when the pet was going to tear really. Yeah, because it's not, it's not probably a weight that you would have laughed at, really. But it was just the straw that broke the camel's back. Well, that's the that's the irony. Like when when I did mine, I thought I had a shoulder injury, so I avoided shoulders for a couple of weeks. We carried on doing chest. Mm. It turned out it was the insertion into my shoulder from my chest that ended up snapping off. So yeah, um, I won't labour the point on that one too much. So no. honestly, it's quite it's quite relevant to me. That's all. So that's why I asked. What um, what I wanted to um, explore from that point was of like the difference over the pond of the of the training style. And um, I found that like when I went to LA and stuff and just even looked around at the guys or like, you know, I went to Gold's like every day for like a week and with the same guys every day, just kind of just doing 20 reps, like what looked like kind of just flushing stuff around. And I reckon if I would had a 20 in my pocket, they could have got another three, you know, or, or something like that. Um, and, um, you know, do you think the outcome is, is different? Are they chasing like soccer? plasmic hyperplasia or like are they trying to like you know it's different i mean that style of training has never really resonated with me and i think you should always train a way that you enjoy and um i like to get in and fuck shit up and leave um so the idea of doing like loads of volume like i kind of have to do a little bit more being that's kind of what i do if i'm injured mm -hmm. do you think there's an out uh, like an outcome difference yeah, that you you meant you made me laugh with the sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. That that that's that's the sort of the terminology they use over here. Um, they're they're very um, science driven, so mm. so to speak. I mean, there's a time and place for science, but I think at the end of the day, the um, it, it it's it's just pump training. It's just that's pretty much what most people do here. Um, and then what I what really, if I look at their physique over the two, three, three or four year period, they don't look as though they've changed. They look the same. Um, but I think you've got to go heavy to hit the myofibrils, you know, to go, to go deep tissue. I, I think there's a, there's a lot of um, value in, in going heavy. Um, with the peripheral muscle groups, you can obviously go a little bit lighter, but I think um, that was one thing that I personally feel like is the paradigm in England. If I, maybe that's through Yatesy, I don't know, but it is to train a little heavier uh, and with more intensity. But I think the Brits are very intuitive with their body. Whereas over here, it's just the mentality is still, it's still with the same mentality is beast mode. More is better. Train twice a day, uh, two hour sessions, do more, 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 do more, more drugs, more food, more training, more, more is better, so to speak. Mm. So, do, do you think them? Um when they're doing the high volume and the lighter weights, do you, do you think they get like a softer look? Because I, I see people that, that go really heavy all out, seem to get that deep, granity, hard, dense muscle that you're just never going to get if you don't fucking push hard enough and lift those kind of weights. Do you see much of a difference? You, you, hit, you hit the nail on the head, Dean. I really think there's... You, there's a correlation between someone that trains light year round to someone that trains a little heavier. You, you can definitely see the work ethic that's gone into the guy that's gone heavier. I mean, look at Yates's physique with the, the dense muscle that he had. No one, no one to, still to this day that I've seen has really emulated that type of hardness or that, or that type of conditioning that, that, uh, that Yates had, you know, I could be wrong, but I think you're right, Dean. <laughs> I think the closest of today, you're looking like Hadi on stage. He has that granity look, and then you're looking how he's training. Mm -hmm. him banging out reps on five twenties aside squats, he's lunging with like three plates aside shit. Like he's going heavy and hard. So that it must be, isn't it? Yeah, I think the key to it all, I think maybe is a blend of both systems and both both energy systems. You know, um, th th there could be some truth to that. If you look at um, Honey Rambod's training, right, th this FST7 that's still going around over here, it it's a mix of both. It it's it's the heavy stuff, and then you do one exercise where you would do like a muscle round or or the fascia stretch training principle, 
of um, seven sets with high reps and very little rest time. <coughs> it's metabolic condition and it's metabolic stress. Basically, that's what it is. But um, I think it's desirable to go heavy if you've got really good form. I think that's just the way I believe effort and uh, work ethic is is the name of the game with, with bodybuilding. And I think that's still my opinion why the, the great bodybuilders uh, have always been, you know, from from the UK. Uh, I just think that it's got it's a different different um, mentality in in the UK. I think we've all been brought up to work ethic and and shut out the, the the distractions in the gym and just go in there and just cause havoc and then yeah. go hard, rest, sleep, eat, grow. Yeah, I've, seen, yeah. I've never I've never been able to go and I've never been a two like two two and a half hour in the gym. I just my mind floats. I don't like taking huge rest sets and stuff like rests between and stuff like the pace has to be there. Like I, even if I won't wait for kit, even if I have to wait 10 minutes, I'm just not doing it because yeah. I just like, it'll put me out of my flow as well. The phone's in the bin, the tripod's certainly not fucking coming out. Um, you know, I just, I can't, as soon as something like that, like throws me off, then I just like, just, just deflate. Like, and it gets to like after an hour or whatever. And I'm like, is what I'm doing now actually the reason I'm going to grow? Probably fucking not. Yeah. I just, I, and you should do what you enjoy. If you if you enjoy like doing volume training and stuff, like you're probably more likely to progress doing that because you like doing it. So you'll do it better. Um, but I just, I've always hated training like that, which is actually being a bit older and having to train a bit more sensibly is kind of what I've been forced into. And it has taken some of the fucking love out of it, to be honest. Yeah, it's a good point. You, know, you see like the 18 year olds talking about longevity. Well, I want longevity in the sport. It's like, well, I wanted to see if you're any fucking good yet. Go and lift some heavy stuff, see if you can actually get big and then worry about how long you can stay in the industry for once you weigh more than eight stone. <laughs> the funny part is, is I was at the gym today. There was a guy on the hack squat with two plates aside. He spent like 10 minutes getting the right angle on the tripod, did like four reps, screamed his head off for like 10 seconds. Got out of there and then pressed like stop on the record on the tripod, and he thought that was perfectly normal. I was like, yeah. "It is now, isn't it? It's crazy. It is. The game's it's changed true. so much; it really has." Troy, just going back to your introduction, because uh, I, I feel like, um, I mean, to, to us and the Brits, you was fucking phenomenal, and there's, there's especially. The generation of today they don't know the old school athletes and i think you're kind of down selling yourself a little to how fucking good you was i mean Can we pull some got... pictures up johnny yeah, yeah. i'm gonna, I'm gonna insert on... insert them when i do the intro and that i'll slam a lot of photos in so people can be reminded of what this man truly was because yeah. honestly i don't think they understand the level of muscularity this guy was carrying you know and and the achievements. I mean, you you are one of the very few people in the world that got on stage with Flex Lewis and beat him. Not many people have ever done that. Very <laughs> much, yeah, it was back then. But still, you fucking you beat him. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been on stage with Phil Heath. Uh, you, you're incredible, and I don't think we ever seen the best of you in the pro ranks, unfortunately, no. because you know. things happened. But my question was, you said when you went from a middleweight to a heavyweight, how much weight did you put on and how long did that process take you? Because that's a huge, huge jump. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember that very vi vividly. Uh, yeah, I was about 173, maybe 175. And then a year later, I, I competed at, at the Britain to almost 230. What, uh, one year, 50 pounds yeah, also. <laughs> but obviously, I think I overdieted for the the, the middleweights. Um, came in really, really flat, uh, and I remember that year I had to peak twice. I had to diet twice in one year, which was hard to do. Um, but yeah, I, I really feel like as a pro, I didn't really. There was still muscle I could put on my frame, even after four, four pro shows. There was mm. still a lot more growing to do, and I worked with Chris Aceto a couple of times and Honey Honey Rambod and. They would say, yeah, you, you can put another 15, 20 pounds on your frame and still keep your waist in check. Um, but, I, you know, being young and having a bit of an ego and a little bit of an attitude, I think that costs me and moving over too quickly. If I if I'm if I would start over again, I think 
staying close to your mentor or your your coaches is is vital in in those situations if you're thinking about moving over. Um, but everything happens for a reason. If I hadn't done what I did, I wouldn't have met my partner that I'm with now. We wouldn't have the online business that we have right now currently. So everything happens for a reason and a purpose. And at the time, it serves you. So, but it's weird, guys. I wanted to share you, share something with you guys. I found this this really cool quote yesterday, and it says. Um, happiness often sneaks through the back door you didn't know you left open and just of late I've had um, more of a sort of an epiphany towards the love of bodybuilding again it's just come out and completely left field it's come out of nowhere and um, I think that's probably why maybe I'm, I'm marketing a little bit differently on Instagram now and going back to the pure muscle gym in Burlington in Ontario I have a, a really appreciation and love for, for the sport again. Um, 10 years ago, it wasn't like that. I actually didn't like it at all. I, I hated it. I hated everything to do with it. Um, so when you did your pack and you kind of realised that that was it, because obviously you can say now, in hindsight, it happened for a reason and all that sort of stuff, but that's something that only comes, you know, with hindsight. How did you actually cope with that? transition of knowing that it was done yeah it's, it's still hard now um it really is still hard now to think i i would if honestly if it was i could i would even love to just take a couple of years and put some muscle back on and maybe just do a show just for the love of it um but you know you've got to know when to stop and and, and when to um you know call it a day so to speak but um i think having this new profound love for the sport again um, is really refreshing. Um, if, in, and I, I just feel now maybe I could give back to the sport a little more. Maybe I could help the up and coming guys um, with, with their physiques and, and, and help them mentor them through, through the process, the journey of muscle building. You've got a, you've got a lot to give, Troy, at the end of the day, bud. You've been there, bought the T-shirt. Uh, and whilst you've made some mistakes, you can teach people. You've also made a lot of progress, put on a ton of muscle, that these days people seem to want to overcomplicate. Um, whilst I appreciate like the society's different now, um, the whole thing with bodybuilding and the gym is slightly more accepted than ever. Um, but in reality, but it'd be a shame for you not to, because mm -hmm. you know, people like us, like we would have bitten the hand off to have somebody like you to give us the information who's been there and done it. You know, I don't want to listen to some seven stone soaking wet guy telling me how to hit strength curves and you know of D loads and shit. No, I want to I want to really know how to add some muscle. Do you know what I mean? But Johnny, that's where you're going wrong. You need to listen to the people that have got a hundred thousand followers plus. It doesn't matter that they're seven stone. They know <laughs> what they're talking about. <laughs> well that's why I've got Dan as my coach because yeah because I weigh eight stone. <laughs> <laughs> What's that one arm? <laughs> one of one of very few people who does actually weigh more than me, and when I complain about being heavy now, he resonates. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm just being stick in my mouth right now and having a nosebleed at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but the um the the <clears throat> again thing, try honestly, but if I'm honest with you, I think you should. Um, you'd still wipe the floor with a lot of people, I'm sure. If it's there, if the appetite for doing it, your physique, I'm sure you'd uh, you'd transform pretty quickly as well. I'm sure you're still in pretty good neck now, anyway. Yeah, I'm still in decent shape, still train. Um, uh, one thing I have noticed is due to the injury that the right arm, has, there's some atrophy going on sort of around the um, the long head of the tricep here, and where that elbow is. I think maybe that's wear and tear and age. You know, when you get that um, sarcopenia where the muscle starts to atrophy. So I can see some of that starting to happen with, with, with my physique. Um, um, but at the same time, um, I haven't really sat down and really put a, a good protocol together, like a, a good nutritional profile and, and a training regimen that I could do. So um, I thought about doing, you know, something this year, um, trying to get into really, really good shape, see, what, see what's underneath all that. But, um, at the same time, I really enjoyed the fasting and, and having energy, um, but then I missed the muscle too. So when I see the guys at Pure Muscle, 
it, it, it's there, man. It really is there. And it's just like, a, you know, you guys know what it's like. It's like that mindset when that, when that switch goes off, right? It, that's it. Decision's done. Um, <laughs> it's the, probably the reason why I've retired five times. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm retiring. And then I'm like, no, but I love doing it. So I'm not going to retire. But as soon as you said the word fasting, then I seen Dean's eyes light up. Yeah, Dean was like, oh, yeah, fuck <laughs> He never want to eat again. Thing. No one should ever eat. This is ongoing thing, Troy. Like most bodybuilders, they kind of realize that bodybuilders are not so healthy as they get older, and they turn to cutting their carbs down and doing fasting so they can be healthy and live long. And uh, every time somebody says the word fasting, Dan and Johnny are like, "Fuck <laughs> off! We're not going down that road again. We still want to get massive, <laughs> thousand grams of carbs a day, or fuck off." Yeah. <laughs> I, I really struggled with the eating though man i've i fucking really struggled like there were days where you were talking earlier in the intro about blending food like we used to do that all the time and and i remember doing the chicken breasts and the, the tuna and then putting some uh coke in there just to give it some flavor and it was fucking nasty <laughs> it was not i'm still you know there told me to do that eddie abu he yeah, said, we were having food. Yeah, yeah. Said, Eddie, Eddie's been on. Eddie was on the podcast a few months ago, yeah. and he was telling us about because obviously that's where Dan got it from in that's the magazine. Where I got it from. Yeah, so the tuna and the coke thing. But yeah. uh, I'm, I'm kind of living it for the first time. This is the first time I've had to really start sort of blending my food now to get the consumption in because to to yeah. eat it, it would literally like it would be a full time job. The amount of calories that Dan's put me on now, I would literally have to just sit here continuously and eat. So I have to blend and drink, otherwise I would just do nothing. I had, I had no one to teach me, so I did the, the tuna and brine, and just with water, <laughs> blend it. It was beautiful. <laughs> you were, you were I, saying earlier, Dan, that, um, sorry, Johnny, you were up to, what, 7,000 calories now? Um, Troy, at, at your biggest, when you was really pushing food, what was the most that you did? It, yeah, I think it was getting up to six. Yeah. Was that yeah. clean? Clean calories or? A pretty bit much. Of, like, fats or? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was a, lot it was food, a very it? clean eater. Yeah. It's a lot of food, isn't it, when it's clean? Yeah. So just uh, for anyone out there thinking about blending food, there's a list of things that I would suggest that are blendable and things that are really not. And by process of, of elimination, I figured that out. Um, I would suggest not blending your beef and potato meals because it's like drinking spew. Um, but the chicken and rice is okay. Tuna is okay. Obviously, tuna is not on my diet, but I've done that in the past. Um, anything that's, you know, going to blend into sort of fine beef and potato, no. Doesn't no, tuna is all right because it's quite light, but blending like beef mince, and I did do it like once, is even a bit too much for me. And I can, <laughs> I'd can, drink baby sick if I needed to. Um, <laughs> it is, is, yeah, it's something. Um, if you could get it in, cool. I know some people that just, some bodybuilders that can just eat. They can just fucking eat. And um, but I've always had a shit um, um, appetite. Never been a big eater. Was never a big person as a kid. Um, I just, you know, I'm not to say it wouldn't. It was impossible, but each meal would take me the amount of time that it would be to do the fucking next one. So <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do anything. Um, so yeah, I, um, yeah, I'm a big. I like blending. Yeah, I, back in I, the day, I used to do. Uh, so we carry on. We used to take, um, what was it, GHRP6. Mm. And that used to help me get a ton of food in. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's still kicking around. Yeah, it's still kicking about. I just found that, like, it worked for a bit. So you could, like, do it for a bit at, like, the end of a push or something. And then I just, I found, like, that after a while it kind of wore off. And then I'd stop doing it. And then I'd almost have, like, the opposite happen. So yeah, then, yeah. Plus, I, I think some of it's not even an appetite thing. It's a time consumption thing. Like chewing beef and potato takes time, especially when my meal is half a kilo of potatoes and 250 grams of beef. Chewing that and actually just swallowing it, the time consumed doing that alone, never mind the appetite. Like Dan said, by the time I finish it, it's time for the next one. 
Mm. Just like, nah, just, yeah, whatever. I like guys. how Eddie, Eddie Abu was like the, the king. Yeah. The blender. Because I was trying to remember who it was, because I remember exactly where I was, where I, where I found, found it. I was on the train to London. I was looking at the magazine and um, there was some guy, and I couldn't remember. And then when he came on, I was talking about it. I said, like, I can't remember. And he was like, it was me. It was in the Flex magazine. And I was like, you are the reason I was able to. I, I couldn't do it. I don't think I could do it if there wasn't a blender in the world. I didn't. I couldn't get the food in. As some people can, and I think it's. I think it's better if you can eat it. I think it probably digests better. But I've always. But you were saying you're always a clean food guy. I also find that trying to do it in shit works like one meal, but then it clogs up and you feel so shit that then it messes up the next meal you feel even like less like so i think the grand scheme of it it doesn't process correctly and so it doesn't make it any easier anyway it's easier for that singular meal but well, in the span of the day it just that's exactly what lee priest was saying wasn't it when he was on so we had lee priest on and he was telling us about how he used to use junk food and that but he said what he used to find was he'd eat his junk food and his stomach would be so swollen and he wouldn't be able to digest it that he wouldn't eat for hours then until the next one. And he said one thing he wished that he had done in the off season was pushed food a little bit more, probably gone a little bit cleaner so that he could eat more regularly. But he said every time he ate shit food, he would get that issue with digestion, you know? We well, your hunger as well, isn't it? The, all the bad fats and all that is going to kill your hunger off so you don't want to eat more. And it takes so long to digest it. And there's bad oils and crap in your system. It's going to yeah. clog everything, can it? Yeah. So it, I mean, we, we all know, like, eating crazy amounts of food and too much of certain drugs are going to extend and bloat your gut out. So do you think that blending at least like a couple of meals or half your food is to everybody? Do you, do you think that would help keep the belly bloat down, the extension of pushing it from the inside out? Because mm. eating so much food, is, it's a lot, isn't it? Uh, See, I think great. it makes it worse. I think it makes it worse. Mm. Yeah, I think I do, get, I do get quite a bit of bloat yeah. from it. I agree. Yeah. I think it worse for sure. Yeah, I, I, I've had issues with my stomach being a short guy. I'm, I, how tall are you guys? I'm five six. Um, oh, somebody, somebody shorter than me. I'm five seven. <laughs> I'm the I'm the third in the rank. I'm five eleven. Dan's like six two or six one. Yeah, about that. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like a a, a dwarf amongst midgets. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I definitely found that the having to eat a lot of food, the, the midsection definitely blew up and got really big, especially the couple of shows I did as a pro. Looking back at some of the pictures, I had a lot of a lot of distension. And that could have been from um use carbon up with insulin. I don't know, but I was I've, I've always had issues with in, insulin using it and the distension that I had. Yeah, I did I did think that there was a, an era as well, around about the end of Jay Cutler's reign, where they were clearly doing really severe carb ups. Because uh, everyone said it was the growth gut, but if it was the growth gut and their internal, I mean, it doesn't grow internal organs anyway, but if it had, then they wouldn't be able to bring it in. And they did seem to bring it in after they gave it to Dexter Jackson in 2008. They, you know, the rest of the guys that were left did bring it in, even Kai Green brought it in. Um, and I think insulin, um, you know, for carb ups and stuff, you do end end up with with that. And I think age as well plays a, a part a part in it. The muscles, the TVU, and everything don't play ball as well. Get tighter and stuff, and the ability to control that midsection diminishes. Yeah, if you stretch out that muscle wall, you can't really contract them as well, can you? So mm. it's all going to bloat out. I, I never believed that growth hormone really bloated stomachs out so much more like the insulins and things like ghrp6 that's enabling you to eat a lot more food than you normally would i think over time but the bottom line is it's the food isn't it when you're eating that much food co consistently it has to stretch it out because you, you your stomach just can't cope with that amount of food and it, this is what i've always said like if me me going pro 212 is like my limit for my genetics to get into the big guys. I would have to take that much food on that my waist would be blown out. So how, how could I stand next to somebody like a, a flex wheeler with this tiny, beautiful waist? He, he needs to eat half the amount of food that I would to have the same amount of muscle. It's not going to happen, is it? So you've got to play to your strengths, I guess. And 
if you're like you're down and you weigh over six foot, you'd fuck it, get as big as you possibly can. You stretched it out, but yeah. Yeah, it's a, different, it's a different, uh, it's a different aim anyway. Obviously, you're aiming for a more aesthetic look. Dan's looking for a bit of a spew in the mouth kind of physique. Um, so it does. You've got to play to what you've got. You've got <laughs> Dan, play. Dan's like, if you're not sick a little bit when you see me, then I've disappointed <laughs> myself. <laughs> well, I just think like, if I tried to play the aesthetic games, I would have just come up short. And the amount of food being long limbed and stuff like that that I have to put on, and not everyone has that same issue. I'm going to have to take a hit somewhere. Um, yeah, otherwise, I'm going to... You've got for the classic physique, Dan. You've got traps that come out of your ears. It's just not... Yeah, it's not... <laughs> you have traps in your ear holes. I mean, it didn't exist when when we were start when we were starting. I don't know when even, like, the board short thing happened. Was board shorts around when you mm. were around? No, of course they weren't. They, they weren't around when I first started. Um... I mean, when did they start coming? Because there was a huge... I mean, it's died down a bit now, but there was obviously a huge... Oh, yeah. Actually, may, maybe, try. Obviously, towards the end of your, your couple of last pro shows. 2015, maybe. maybe. Yeah. Maybe Men's Physique was about then? Yeah, the last time I competed was 2009. Oh, uh, okay. So I've, I think it may have been around 2011, maybe, 2010. Hmm. Yeah, I was. my first show was 2009, and there was definitely not any Men's Physique about then. Body Power... When I did the show then, and then the British, that was 2011, and there was no board shorts then. I remember being backstage the first time they'd ever introduced it and not being really sure what was happening because there was these guys backstage all helping each other, gel each other's hair, offering shots of alcohol to each other, getting pumped up, sharing sweets and chocolate, and like giving each other compliments. And I was still part of the old school <laughs> bodybuilding <laughs> crew who'd all be, yeah, all be staring each other out. Don't fucking our, look at me. With our heads up in the corner like this. <laughs> I just trying to work. Did, did you do any of that where you'd like try and strip off like last? Yeah. You're playing those games? Yeah, man. Yeah, I was I was always worried about the smaller guys that look small in clothes. Mm. And their they, faces are super top. <laughs> so yeah. thin, like a skeleton. You just go, you like, fuck. <laughs> yeah, never worried about the bigger guys that look really big in clothes. It was always the, the shorter guys that, you know, were, were always... Always, we're always worried about from 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 a competing standpoint. Um, but yeah, is, what's it like in England with with the with the sport and stuff? Yeah, I is mean, I, I I think the standard is is high. I think that it's spread out more though, so you don't have like one show where all the best are at. So you don't get to enjoy it at like a pinnacle point, which I think is a shame. Like from a also from a fan perspective, I'm still a fan. Um, you know, I, I did like the fact that, you know, you went to the UK BFF finals or the, um, um, what was the, what was it called before that? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So you'd, um, you know, you knew the best were there. There was, there was some other people and some NABA guys and you knew that the universe was going to churn out some, some dudes and stuff like that. But ultimately there were like two shows and you knew that if you looked at, the, went to those two shows, you would see the best of the best and you could experience that in, in two shows. And now it's all very spread out and people from the UK are constantly flying out all over the place. Um, cause they've got the opportunity to travel to get their cards. Yeah. So you don't really, see, a lot of UK guys aren't getting their cards in the UK. There's not, you know, because there's only that one opportunity. So a lot of people are not taking that opportunity. They'd rather go and, and try their luck somewhere else. The truth is, is Dan is bitter because he's cut from old school cloth and he thinks that all the best of British should should have a, a scrap and, and the winner should be the winner and they get a pro card. And then these guys are all fucking off the timb Timbuktu for a pro card. And Dan's still trying to stick to the lo loyal faithful. Like, <laughs> I'm going to do this. I'm going to earn it. <laughs> Whereas in reality, I think you should just concede and go to Timbuktu for a project. I think I probably am going to go to Timbuktu. I'm 38 years old. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do the Icelandic classic this year. <laughs> they do give them out like candy over here, though. I must admit. Have they always done that? It, it's the yeah. I mean, no disrespect to anyone listening, but you know, from from an observer looking in, 
you're seeing some of these people that are getting cards and and the the, the standard um it's it's uh it's it's not the best and they do unfortunately give them out like like smarties over here unfortunately because there was a push wasn't there when um well when ukbff got dissolved basically um there was a push and there was a huge amount of cards that started going out because ultimately it's it they realized that there was lots of money to be made you because what do you do? You earn your pro card, yeah? And what the first thing you get after winning something is you they, they sell it to you, don't they? Yeah. You pay them. Like two, 250 pounds for your pro card. Like, yeah. what's the definition of being a professional? <laughs> you get paid for your profession. Not in bodybuilding. You have to pay to be a professional. I've won a, a bill. I've won less money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But Troy, to answer that question, you said um, I think you'd be pretty disappointed if you came to the UK and watched some of the finals now because, yeah, we have so many federations here now. It's so, um, like, there are some good athletes, but they're spread so finely that you might get one good athlete in a whole show if you're lucky. It's really that bad, isn't it? Until you get to the, the finals, it's nothing like it used to when we had guys like you over here. Uh, it was fucking hard then. The standard was high. The standard's shit now. And they are chucking out pro cards a lot easier. Uh, more so to like um, the fitness guys, the broad shorts. And they, they, they seem, I'm, I'm sure there was one show in, in that little stint of when the two bros took over. I think they give out 17 pro cards in one show. I mean, as you know, it, it was one a year when you used to do it, you had to be the best of the best of the best just to get to the fucking British. Then yeah, I had to win your weight class and win the overall to get a pro card. To get out 17 cards in one show, you can see how the, the quality really went downhill. Uh, yeah, I think it's just watered down across too many federations now. Just and money, money has a lot to do with that, with the, with the extra shows that are going on in the UK, obviously. Well, it's, all, I think promoters. it's one of those it's ones, right? So we've, We've got the issue with the two bros, obviously, is it can be quite expensive to compete with two bros. So unless you have a real chance of winning your pro card, you tend to find that only, you know, a couple of the really good guys will do that. Then a lot of them are competing with the other new federations like uh, PCA. I don't know if you heard of PCA. Obviously, um, they're doing really well. They, they, you know, looking after their athletes. They don't have as good of a pro division, but their amateur shows are probably more popular than than the IFBB ones. Um, so there's PCA, then there's a new one called FitX. Obviously, NABA is kind of dead. Um, and then yeah, that's something you'd probably be quite upset about. NABA is fucked. Oh, that's amazing. It's the UK BFF now. I mean, that's really downhill, isn't it? Oh. The final, there was, there was well, have, you heard, have you heard about this new, the new federation they've started, the BPA? Yeah, and yeah. Helen and Sugar started yeah. up. Mm. Yeah, so that's the that's another one that's now started. A couple of guys from the old UKBFF have branched off, one called the BPA. But again, I think that's probably going to fall on his face. Um, but yeah, the real ones, if you're here now in the UK, are PCA um, and Two Bros. And Two Bros is the IFBB. Um, it's the okay. MPC promotion company, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's through the MPC, but it, it's quite expensive to compete with them. You know, it's like 150, 200 pound entry. For a show. Arnold was 250. Yeah, two fifty to enter. What? So yeah. Fuck. Wow. Yeah. So like it is. It is. So, so how much prize money do they get? <laughs> yeah, obviously you get another bill for another two hundred and fifty. <laughs> so actually, if you win your card, then it costs you five hundred quid. That's that's what you win. That's 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 <laughs> the goal. And they don't even, they don't even give trophies out anymore. They give medals and just medals. Ribbon. Yeah, it's like a ribbon. With, it's just a weighted ribbon. One of those plastic wristbands. <laughs> um, but I mean, like yeah, like Johnny said, I think overall, like it's it's you know it's good and British bodybuilding strong. It's just that it's very hard to appreciate in one arena, which I thought was really great. You know, and I think I think there was a middle ground because I I think a lot of people missed opportunities to get pro cards that deserved them. Dean being one of them, and so I I think there was a, a middle ground opportunity. Um, to expand it a little bit um, so that we could let more UK guys into the Pro League. Um, you know, so, 
yeah, there was some middle there was some middle ground. But I think as a whole, like bodybuilding is in terms of athletes, there's loads of great athletes. Um, but yeah, you just don't see all of them go to head to head. So there's also not that excitement of like these guys are all going to turn up and you know who's going to be there. You know, these guys are going and we're going to see them and who's going to win. And, you know, like there was an excitement about, you know, about it. And now you're like, well, this guy's won this show. Maybe he'll do it. No one fucking knows. Um, you know, and then, and then some of them just end up quite weak. Um, so yeah, Navas just actually just didn't bother, um, moving with the times, you know, Instagram's a huge thing in, in this and promotions and stuff and people that are up and coming are really into it as part of their life. And they actually give a fuck about that sort of stuff. A lot of people start up, don't even know what Navas is. Um, and because they've never heard of it because their whole life revolves around Instagram. So without having that social media presence. And then you had COVID, which really was the end of them because they, you know, I mean, I know the, you know, the average promoter of a NABA show is 97 years old, um, but they didn't put on any shows. Like there wasn't any urgency to, to re-engage the shows it felt. And they're still uh, regionally locked as well. So NABA still haven't moved with the times. All the other shows are open. You can kind of pick and choose the ones that fit within your calendar. NABA is like, you've got to compete at this one day of the year if you're on the if you live in this region, that or nothing. And people are just choosing to avoid that, you know? Yeah, that was always a ball ache. That was always a massive ball ache. Yeah. Your regional shows four months before the British. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. And then someone else's is like three weeks. And you're like, I fucking wish I had just three weeks to sort it out. Yeah. yeah. But the, yeah. the other thing I was going to ask you, Troy, um, Dan was just mentioning about the middle ground and me missing out on my pro card. I actually see it as a blessing in disguise. Oh. Uh, uh oh. It's such a blessing that he's died. <laughs> <laughs> he's had a stroke, and that's. He's thinking of what to say. He's, he's lost his train of thought. Yeah, no, he's waiting for the blessing. He's... Did you notice that this week he's got a, a framed photo of himself? Yeah. That wasn't there before. Yeah, with my dad, by the looks of it. <laughs> <laughs> he was freakishly big though when he for a guy of his, his <coughs> physique was freak with it he just looks so much bigger than he was as yeah. well. just... there he is he's oh he's now. sideways now sideways that's good no he's froze again all right fuck him off he's, he's having a mare <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. but i think he was talking about uh you saying things would be in a blessing in disguise Obviously, I'm not really sure what his question was going to be, but um, there's certain aspects that I completely resonate with that one from from my point of view. Um, I wholeheartedly would have probably killed myself trying to be, um, you know, the best bodybuilder that I could have been, and I, I ended up with a career and kids and stuff. My my pec tear was quite early in my in my you know bodybuilding career, which meant that I was able to focus on other things. Um, but like, if that hadn't happened, how far do you reckon? You could have taken it. What was what was kind of the goal? What was what do you think you realistically could have achieved? Yeah, I, uh, the, the turning point is when I moved over. Um, I I should have stayed and uh, stayed for maybe three or four years. Kept kept working, kept improving, and then and then maybe look to have moved over or just stayed in the UK altogether. Right. Um, and I think that's what happens when when you when you get your card and you and people know about you and you move to a new place a new a new area, you know you you kind of believe the hype, right? And you you kind of get um, I'm complacent if that's the right word to use. So I kind of lost the the hardcore edge when when I moved over, um, and then obviously got involved in in a sales business which I shouldn't have got involved in, and then literally just put my love of the sport on the back burner. And I think that's what pissed a lot of people off. And, and looking back, I can see, you know, my own mistakes and I hold my hands up. I take full responsibility, uh, especially where I was and, and, you know, what I achieved. Um, I still believe I could have definitely got to the Olympia. Definitely. That was, that was always the ultimate dream just to get there. Right. Yeah. Dean. No, I'll give him that. Yeah, you definitely, absolutely not a chance that you wouldn't have done if that hadn't happened from, from what we can see. Your physique 
Honestly, it, it's bonkers to think that you didn't stand on the Olympic stage, to be honest. But you, Dean, sorry, you know what, though, guys? I, I think this is where the power, I was mentioning it earlier, but the power of a coach or mentor um, guiding the athletes through, especially someone's got a lot of potential, you know, keeping them level headed, keeping them grounded, keeping them from um, people, you know, basically giving them so many compliments and just saying, well, you're not there yet. You're not that good. Um, and I think that's what Harold did for me. And when I moved over, I didn't have that. I, I lost touch with him. So I really believe in the power of a coach and a mentor because um, he was with me from the very beginning, Harold. Does it, does, it, does it count if your coach tells you your shit all the time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, though. It's, you want people, I think it's good to have friends like that who say, you, yeah, you, you're okay, but you're not great. You, you're not... You're not a top 10 material at Olympia level yet. you still got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it, was, it, it was great. And I, looking back, winning, that, winning the Britain, should have stayed, kept working, and then competed. And then picking, I think the, what I did is I also didn't pick the right shows. Um, I went straight into the deep end, straight into the Ironman, where, you know, obviously Phil, Phil Heath was there and uh, Gustavo Bedell, Tony Freeman, Eddie, Eddie Abu competed as well, Kai, uh, King Kamali, if I remember rightly, Chris Cormier was there, Darren Charles. So there was a big names there. So here I am, this new guy from England in the mix with these guys. And, um, and that year, I remember playing the size game. I knew I had to come in bigger. So I came in at 2.47, two I came in. And I was soft. I looked like shit. Yeah. And actually, believe it or not, three weeks out from the show, I wasn't, I couldn't work. So I was on um, a visitor's visa. So I couldn't work. And um, CMP, chemical nutrition, dropped me. So I had no money coming in. So I just about made, made it over to LA to compete. So I was going through a lot of shit, a lot of stress going into that show. And it, re and it reflected my physique on the day. Yeah. Fuck. Um, Dean, sorry, bud. You keep freezing. Do you want to uh, pick up that question for where you yeah. were? Sorry, my internet's really playing up today. Fucking thing. Um, yeah, what I, I was just going into is is me not getting a pro car was kind of a blessing in disguise because I would have pushed and pushed and tried to do the best I could and it would have impacted on my health. So you, Troy, being at your biggest and obviously you had your pet tear and you dropped a lot of weight and now you're doing fasting and all these things for health and longevity. Do you think if you never tore that peck, you would have pushed and pushed and got as big as you could? Where do you think your health would have been at? It's a fucking really good question. Um, never really gave any thought to that. Um, if it's any consolation, I, I was always the guy that always believed in less is better. Um, I was always very health conscious originally getting into the sport. Um, not only went to take breaks, um, always do, do less than what was prescribed, so to speak. Um, so I was never really a big into the chemicals in the first place. Uh, well, well, even just your work, just being that heavy, being that big, it has a big impact on your body, doesn't it? It did. I actually went and got uh, a couple of years ago, I went and got my heart checked, and they noticed that I had. Um, cardiomyopathy mm. um and that was obviously due to my past and they did, did some more research and more a thorough investigation on my heart and it's okay it's good but i think that's when those issues were when i was just way too heavy uh for my height you know i think the heaviest i got up to is two two seven <laughs> So I do, I say this to a lot of people because they say, oh, you know, like bodybuilding is not healthy, you know, and I was like, it's as unhealthy as being fat. Mm -hmm. And I think the most damaging thing is, is the stress on the body of processing everything. You're holding more mass, the more pathways, you know, even your vascular system and stuff, it needs a higher blood pressure to pump through, like the blood, like you're putting probably the most damaging thing is just your, is your body weight. Um, you know, obviously the drugs have an impact as well, um, but I think the most damaging thing is just lugging around. You know, it's not decent to everyone's frames different or whatever. But if I'm lugging around twenty one stone for like a huge duration of my life, that is just as damaging as being twenty one stone of fat. You know, because everyone says, "Oh, but it's muscle," and I was like, 
no, I'm not. You know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and try and be like, yeah, you want to be as healthy as you can. But if you're wa- walking around, you know, and in your lifespan, you put on a hundred pound of extra muscle, or 150 pound of extra like muscle, your body is not designed to fucking do that. And the compensation that it's got to make, you know, your pancreas um, and all your internal organs and your heart as well, because you will grow your heart along with everything else. Like most of the time you're going to get left ventricle hypertrophy. Most people are going to do that. Um, you see that with cardiovascular um, endurance sports anyway as well. But ultimately, like carrying around that that weight is probably the most dangerous thing about it. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Dan. And I think one of the big problems is is carbs. When you're eating a lot, a lot of carbs over years and years, you're going to fuck your body up. I mean, I, I don't know anybody that's got big on not eating carbs, just having proteins and fats. I mean, once you've gotten big, it's quite easy to maintain that muscle. And I, I can maintain good muscle mass on virtually no carbs now. I push my good fats up. But to get big in the first place, mm-hmm. you've got to eat a lot of fucking carbs. And to do that over years is going to fuck with your pancreas, which is going to fuck with your liver, which is going to fuck with your gallbladder and your kidney. It all goes hand in hand. You start to get deficiencies in fat-soluble vitamins. All kinds of problems will stem off. Just Most bodybuilders will become uh, pre-diabetic, if not diabetic, because of the amount of carbs. And it's like, well, I don't eat sugar. Every fucking carb you eat will be broken down to sugar. It just depends how fast it does, depending but- on... Free insulin. Say again. Free insulin. Mm -hmm. Free insulin. (laughs) (laughs) It's not when you're gonna die because you get some free insulin. It's not. Sorry, I was just trying to lighten the mood a little bit. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) I mean, I'm not a good advocate of pushing insulin, but if you're a bodybuilder, you're eating a lot of carbs. Insulin is probably the only thing that's gonna help your fucking health to help your body cope with the amount of fucking stress you're putting on your body by cramming that much food consistently. Here's here's the thing about being a professional athlete and stuff on a a certain thing. The guys at the top and the young guys, you ask other people and stuff, you ask someone in MMA, hey, look, you're going to die in five years, but you'll win your weight category world title. They take it. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're young, you don't give a fuck. You don't give a fuck. And actually the, the champions at the top, they're not going to be able to pay too much attention to their health. They're not. And I, okay, I, they can like get some blood results and be like, okay, well, I'm not dead this year. But ultimately, like you are going to pay later. Of course you're going to pay. So it kind of fucks me off a bit about everyone preaching like health phase and stuff like that. It's damage limitation. It's not health. <laughs> if you want to be healthy, stop fucking bodybuilding, you know. But it's your choice, you know, and it's your thing and it's an extreme sport. But it's not. It's you are, and you might get away with it. You might. Doran got away with it. Looks like you got away with it. Jay Cutler got away with it. Like some people get away with it. But if you've got a couple of little dips in your genetics, it's going to exacerbate the situation, and you could be checking out early. That's just how it is. That's it, mate. I mean, I I was there. I, I was like Troy. I was very health conscious through my bodybuilding. But you get to that, you win the British. You do this. You you don't give a fuck. You want to win your next show you start to push the boundaries a bit more and a bit more. So I, I completely understand it until you get out and then you're like, I'm at the point now, my my health, my longevity is way more important than winning a trophy. But back 10 years ago, it wasn't. Mm-hmm. That's why I was asking that question to you, Troy, where, where do you think you would have pushed it to and how much do you think you would have pushed your health? Yeah, uh, I don't think I actually answered the question, but yeah, I think I, I was willing to do whatever it took, to be honest. I mean, 270 at five foot six, I'm sure you're pretty lean at that as well. That's yeah. a huge, huge amount of muscle and weight to be carrying around on that frame. Uh, can, can you remember how you felt at that point? Oh, yeah. I, did. I, felt, I felt like shit. This not, not kidding to ever run. I definitely felt tired all the time. Um, and having to train clients on top of that was just, I was miserable. But you had the goal at the end of it. So you were like, I'm willing to do whatever it takes in order to, to, to look my best. So, and that's the thing I, I do love about bodybuilding is, you know, the, 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 the mental toughness and the resilience that you have to have as a man in order. And I think that's not talked about a lot 
in the sport. Um, it, it's it's the resilience and the mental toughness you have is 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 you need to. I used to watch. I don't know you guys. I used to watch the battle for the Olympias and watch Ronnie's training video over and over and over again while getting ready for for, for nationals. And I used to say, like, how the fuck does he do it? Like, how, how does he just keep a smile on his face? He's so happy. He works 18 hours a day, trains twice a day, and he's three weeks out, and he's smiling away, he's squatting 800 pounds, and he's loving it. And here I am just struggling just to, just to do normal things, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, Ronnie's probably not a good marker to use. Is- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But at, at the time, yeah. But that's but that's true. Like they say, like and there's never a truer quote that's like, you need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's what people like. They start their journey like, well, I feel a bit shit. Maybe we could. And it's like, you're gonna feel shit like ninety percent of the time. Do you know what? That, actually... the, the irony is, is I'm that's exactly where I'm at now. It, like through, I've been bodybuilding a long time. Obviously, I've not pushed things. I had anorexia as a kid, so I used to struggle with the feeling of being full anyway and things. So in the past, I would push up to a reasonably heavy weight. I would shit myself and I would hate it and I would instantly come back down. So the commitment I've made to myself this year is I'm going to get to that point where I'm uncomfortable. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to try and get to that point where that becomes normal for me, try and normalize my body weight at that point to allow that tissue to stick. But Mm. And that's the thing is, I think it's taken me a long time to get that point now where I'm like, right, if I'm going to do it, I'm just going to do it now. But in reality, I used to do exactly what you're saying there, Dan. I used to to come up and go, oh, this is horrible. I'm not doing this. And come back straight back down. Mm. And that's that's the thing that's within your control. Like if you have to push the boundaries in this thing because people like they get so obsessed about prep, but you can't get better in a prep. You can fuck up. You can fuck up a prep. But you can't actually improve in a prep. So people, they go and do a prep and then they're like, oh, off seasons, the wrong word off is the, just the, not, not the correct term. Like, and actually people do call it improvement season, which actually makes me sick in my mouth anyway. Just <laughs> um, But like, is it, that's the bit where you actually get better, but people are like a prep. And I know this sounds stupid, but prep is easy. You only have to stay like adherent for like that, period and then the idea of someone who's new to it is like well i do the prep and then i can go back to normal no not if you want to be a competitive athlete you'd go and you do the prep again from the moment you step off stage it's, it's one extreme to the other isn't it when you're trying to lose fat you're fucking starving yourself you're trying to gain weight you're fucking force feeding yourself there's no oh a lay off and have an easy good time you can have a week off you know maybe after a soon have a little week off you know go on holiday maybe talk to your wife for a second or something right bitch <laughs> and then like and then <laughs> and a then a week off yeah Troy, Troy how long would you have off after a show I'm not stop training man I, I I was back in the gym literally the next day next just day Love, just love the gym. It's, it's. I think maybe that has more of a love for bodybuilding is the actual gym itself. But so, so a side note, I was thinking about Dexter Jackson and Sean Ray. Th- th- those were guys that their physique didn't really change year to year. Um, and both of them obviously walked away scot-free pretty much. Um, and I think maybe that had something to do with their conditioning and they didn't really get out of shape in the off season and they just stayed in striking distance and they knew their body so well, but they looked the same year after year. Yeah, I mean, but, Sean was never that big, was he? But he looked unbelievable, so he could pull it off. So he didn't have to put massive stress on his body. And De- Dexter was uh, bigger, he got a lot heavier, but no, still nowhere near as big as the big boys. I, th- I think that they they had they got to their genetic point until it got hard, and then just didn't need to, and then they just held it. And Dexter just was the most consistent bodybuilder, and he was good enough even at that point to just hold. Like mm. you know, they they done, and you're right. Like he was able to like have that long because his genetics meant that he didn't really need to pull push but you know these aren't mere mortals <laughs> like you know if you're i always say this if you're wonder if you're watching this wondering if you're a if you're a genetic freak you're not because you wouldn't be watching this <laughs> because you'd already you'd just be growing and you probably don't even really like know that much about bodybuilding because you don't need to 
um, you know, these are these are the elite. For the mere mortals, you're going to feel wank for like a most most of the time. You know, and even that, like probably from a genetic standpoint, everyone here is still like top one percent. Like you're obviously higher than me, and Dean, you probably are as well. But like, you know, there's lower. But when we're talking about the Olympia guys, we're talking zero point zero 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 one percent of genetic elite. Um, you know, and then when they well, when then then when they push the boundaries, you get Ronnie Coleman. That's what happens. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's unbeatable then, isn't it? When you get both, you get the the superior genetically gifted freak who puts in the most crazy amount of effort and energy, then that you got Ronnie Coleman and you nobody's touching it. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's Phil Heath. I always say this: Have you ever watched a Phil Heath training video? Not for more than five seconds. Boring. They're fucking boring as fuck. And if I went and did what he did, I'd weigh in four stone. And just nothing would happen. He he trained uh he came and trained at a gym and um he was strong as fuck. He's just pushing weight around effortlessly, moved a bit of blood, and his fucking arm just popped out here somewhere. I was like, what the fuck? I had to poke his his fucking forearm because I, I was in disbelief to what it was. I thought he had a baby inside it. It was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I remember Ow. seeing him at the at the Iron Man pumping up backstage. And I was saying to my previous partner at the time, I was like, what's, what's all the fuss about, really? Uh, he was like 2, 220, 223. But when he, uh, it, honey was in front of him, and I remember literally standing two meters away, honey said to him, do a most muscular. And then when he hit the most muscular, it was like a fucking transformer. It was like, <laughs> it was like, Okay, now I know why you're the gift. Yeah. <laughs> it was weird because you saw him like before on stage, you'd be like, he's off. He's off. He looks off as fuck. Off. And yeah, it's off like two off. shots, and you're like, how has this happened? <laughs> like from the back is what we forget how good fucking Phil Heath was, and it wasn't that long ago. From the back, you'd be like, well, nothing's going to show through that. And you just twist out, and the hamstrings come out like hands. And you're just like, that did not look like that was going to happen. It, it, yeah. Another guy, Canadian bodybuilder, reminded me, uh, Fuad. Fuad was like that. I competed against Fuad a couple, a couple of times in the pros, and he was like that. He didn't look that great, relaxed, but as soon as he hit a shot, fuck, man, he come to life. How does that work? Because uh, I see, like like Phil, like you just said, he looks soft. And he, in some, you think, oh, he's, he's fat, he's off. And then he hits. Every individual muscle pops and stands out. His arm, it looks like he's got three torsos because his arm's as big as his fucking torso. How does that even happen? But when you, you see him training and how gifted he is, and you look at his physique, it, it, there's no zero fat on him, every individual muscle, but you don't see any big fat pipe veins or anything hanging out, do you? And I only yeah. seem to see that on people that really fucking train intense and hard. When it's you a myo, myo, myostatin, the myostatin deficiency in it. Yes. He's just uh he's just one of them people that can put on tissue. Imagine if Phil Heath had Ronnie Coleman's work ethic. That's the only well, person I think better, that could have potentially Yeah, but I think that's the only person who could have potentially been even bigger than Ronnie. Yeah. But that that's the thing, is like when you're that good, like where would you actually have put would you have put anything if you could have drawn it on Phil? How would you have drawn it on? Yeah, but you've all seen the the, the Photoshop vid, um, photos of like the Belgian blue bow. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It'll just yeah, be yeah. it'll be like a cloud. It'll be like that Photoshop vid photo of of Dean that went around for a little while, the one that <laughs> made him look like the human cloud. It would just be that, but actually real. <laughs> There's a few of them. Fucking hilarious. There are a few bodybuilders though as well. Where you do look at them and you just think, where would? How would you do it? Like, even if you could just draw it on, like, and I think Phil Heath is one of those who's just so complete. Like, what would you do with it? Mm. It was done. It was fi it was finished, and that's why he reigned for so long. And what was he on stage like two forty? Yeah, like two forty, and he looked. It didn't matter because he looked more muscular. That's another thing people go about. Being, it's not about being big. You've got to look muscular. You know, it's it's a different like concept. You know, like Brian Shaw's big, two hundred kilos. But like you know, zoom zoom out. He doesn't look like a muscular guy. So, this so, actually, 
brings me on to the thing that I was going to mention. Have you seen this thing now that Eddie Hall is going to be a bodybuilder? It's fucking not, though, is it? It's that. bonkers. It's bonkers because he reckons he's going to make the Olympia. That was in his first video. He said he's going to make the Olympia. This is just, a, it's just a, a, another publicity stunt, isn't it? Eddie's just all about numbers and getting the views now, isn't it? It's, come on. He's, he's huge. He's got a ton of muscle, but he'd look atrocious as a bodybuilder. Even if he brought that waist right the way down, he's just right the way down. How, how can you bring that down? He looks like a walking fridge. Yeah, he, he just you just couldn't. As big as big as he is all over, his, his arms and legs would look tiny. I was really <laughs> impressed with Terry Holland. Terry looked great. Yeah. Like how did impressed. how did he bring that? Because as well, he got into he got really fat as well when he stopped training. But he did actually like have a waist. I mean, he but, had like let's caveat that Terry had a belly. So underneath the belly, he's obviously managed. You look at Eddie Hall, he's got abs on top of that thick, like you just see it. It's like it is actual muscle in his midsection. Mm. It just he's looks so it looks dense and thick. And you're just like, you can diet all you want. That ain't going anywhere. Mm. Oh, shall we do five top tips? Yeah. So what we do. Oh, no, we, we, we brought it down to three. three yeah. Quite a lot. yeah. So obviously we've been doing this for a little while with our guests. We 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 kind of throw this at them and it kind of catches them off guard a little bit. So we used to do five top tips. It's now three because five is too hard. So for people watching the podcast or listening to the podcast, three tips that you would give them just through sort of life experience of your own. It doesn't have to be bodybuilding related, but obviously with it being kind of a body, I'd say kind of a bodybuilding podcast because we just talk shit. Um, but, you know, three tips that you you could give to anyone really. Oh, excuse me. Life tips, yeah? Yeah, anything. It can be life. It can be it can be anything. Like, or, you know, some of the stuff we've had has been dreadful. So don't, don't, feel, <laughs> don't feel too pressured. Um, I think integrity is everything. Mm. Be integral. Um, tell the truth if, when, whenever possible. And take full responsibility of your life. And don't, and don't blame others. Oh, the I last, see that the all last. The time. It's not my fault. It's his fault, or it's her fault, or it's my wife's fault, or it's my husband's fault. It's never my fault. Oh, that's the last one's a fucking pandemic. It's the most um, grown-up thing anybody can do is take responsibility for their own actions because not many people do. They always want to blame somebody else, isn't it? No, it's but it's, it's worse, worse now than ever. The victim mentality. Do you know what? It's like they all get together and they all think it's okay now because it's so normal to play the victim and do fuck all about your life. Yeah. Yeah. Body I, mean, that, I mean, that was pretty much three off the bat, so I feel yeah. like I just want to have another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's I mean, I, those were, they were too good. It was like, I was also hoping to burn five minutes and just, just laid it out straight up. <laughs> what about getting massive? A tip for getting massive. Do the work, man. Do the work and play the long game. Play the long game. It doesn't happen tomorrow. It's 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 a lot of fucking work, and you got to do your time. Keep your head down, and stop listening to too many cooks in the kitchen. I think that's a lot. Of, I see that a lot. Too many people listen to too many cooks in the kitchen. Everyone's got their own belief about how how to do it. Um, stick stick to one person and go in, all in with them and listen to exactly what they say and and. Do and just I think when I when I started to really excel in the UK was when I decided to stop listening to the guys at the gym, cover up, and listen to one guy and one guy only. Yep. And that's when things started changing for me. Because you do need to take one methodology in its entirety. Yeah. You can't mix and match. Because because also most people will end up taking the easiest bit of each one. And mold it into a... We had a we had a, a, an old client come and see us the other day, and um, I won't mention their name. And uh, they they were telling us that um, oh yeah, I got my diet for my coach and and my training program, but I don't follow it. So why would you pay someone money? Why? What? Where's your commitment? You know, you you you. Where, where's your coachability? There, there's no coachability factor. Oh, but, but I know how to train. I know how to eat. Well, why are you getting advice from them then? So, like, it. so, Troy, um, obviously you've been there, you've done that, you've mingled with the best in the fucking world. Um, what you just said about don't listen to too many cooks in the kitchen, if somebody would like 
your help and your advice, where can they reach out to you and find you? Yeah, Instagram, Coach Troy Brown. Um, that, that's where I'm trying to really get good at is my coaching ability now. Um, it's a different animal from bodybuilding, actually trying to coach people. Um, obviously, I'm working with, with some physique athletes, but I tend to work with CEOs and uh, people that own companies and stuff that want to put on muscle. Um, but my, mostly you can find me on is um, Coach Troy Brown Instagram. Um, my online business is called apexphysiques.ca. And then I've got my music too, which I'm, which I'm really big into, my music production. So I'm, I'm, I have a lot of house music online that I've done in the 90s and, and the 2000s. So that's where I want to eventually go into, uh, along, with the, along with the coaching. Is the well, I've, that, me I've missed, I've missed, missed a huge... huge. <laughs> I've missed. I've like. I've missed the whole. There's a. There has to be another podcast now. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that Dan's like, what the fuck was I asleep? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just literally made Dan's eyes light up. Oh uh, yeah. No, I taught music production for ten years, and I. No way. Writing dance music and shit like that. Yeah. I will talk, brother. We'll yeah. talk. Yes. <laughs> I want to hear some nineties house bands for sure. I want to. I want to hear. I want to hear a collab. Collab. I want to. I want to hear a, <laughs> a remix. Yes. Back, yeah. back to back. Troy and Dan. Back to back. DJ set. And <laughs> Troy, send, send me a link to the music. I want to hear that as well. My older brother makes a bit of music, and he's into the old trance and stuff like that, and dance music. So, yeah, uh, I see you on a. I can see you in a trance rave, Dave, wow. um, Dean. Like the, what was it, like the techno Viking? <laughs> the, the trance egg, they could call you. I'm the trance egg. Trance <laughs> egg. <laughs> on that like point Michelle if you want to send us the link over try I'll put it on the description on the YouTube so people can visit your Instagram and your uh, your music stuff as well so I'll put it on there so I we can uh, yeah and um, yeah I'd be interested to have a little listen to that as well um, and I'm sure Dan will so send that over but and again I just want to really thank you for taking the time I know it's the middle of the day for you so it's much more of an inconvenience for you we're kind of winding down here ready to finish our day we've kind of taken a big chunk of the middle of your Sunday so thank you for for spending your time with us man Mate, it's, it's been, been an honor. honor been an honor man being on the show with you guys thank, thank you so much it's been it's great to get back in the energy again yeah man well we'll get you back for a part two it looks like there's a bit that we've uh Oh, we've, definitely, so, we've definitely skimmed over. I definitely, I definitely talked too much because we haven't done one. We didn't do one last week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're up for it, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll. In a couple of months, we'll, we'll reconvene and get a, another one going. I'd love to. It will be on, on. Thank you so much, mate. Great yeah, to meet mate. you. Finally, thank you. Yeah, Thanks, you, gentlemen. Peace out. Take Peace care, out. boys. <laughs>